certain balancing game you play um, and you're optimizing T. And so maybe just to cut a long story short, let me just tell you what you get. Um, OK. So um, OK. So as it turns out, um, you get something which is exponentially small. Um, OK. So after you optimize um, if, um, this, this quantity is bounded by some, some exponentially small quantity, which is x of minus a small constant times this big constant c squared. OK. So um, our original quantity, therefore, is bounded by this entropy cost, a to the n, which is big, but times this um, large deviation probability, which is small. And this is an absolute constant. And c is something that, that, that we didn't specify, but, but uh, you know, this times the entropy cost is OK if c is large enough. OK, so th this little c is something very explicit, like one quarter. Um, but yeah, if you take big C big, C, um, big enough, this exponential gain will overcome this, exponential, this entropy cost, and then you win. Okay. So um, right, that's basically it. Okay, modulo of this computation, which I'm going to skip. Okay. Um, all right. So that that's the, the largest singular value. Um, now, you can try the same method for the least singular value. Uh, and this turned out to work for rectangular matrices, but not so, but not so well for, for square matrices. So the next result I'm going to say is that uh, suppose you have a matrix which is really rectangular. So, so P is not only less than N, but P is actually less than 1 minus epsilon times N. So um, and, and epsilon is, is some, actually, um, I might be using epsilon for too many things. Let me just, um, let me call it delta. OK, so you have a matrix which is genuinely, um, genuinely rectangular. OK, so, okay and M is, is Bernoulli. OK, so now what we're going to show is that the, the, the least singular value. So we showed that the largest single value is bounded above by a constant root n. Um, we showed that the least singular value is bounded below by a constant times root n, where the constant depends on delta. It will go to 0 if delta goes to 0. In fact, it, it has to. Um, okay, and with exponentially high probability. Okay, so it's a very similar result. Okay, so so just as the large the largest single value can't get much bigger than root n, in the rectangular case, the the, the smallest uh, single value can't get much less than root n. Okay, so um, yeah, so the spectrum sort of is wedged. You know, spectrum is is, is uh, the, the the singular spectrum is is wedged between two models of root n. Um, as as matrix becomes more and more square, uh, what happens is, is that this c equals zero. Um, but uh, okay, but uh, but for for genuine kind of matrices, there is a gap, which you can exploit. Okay, so um, you can do the same sort of game as before. Um, right. So. Um, but the main thing you need is a variant of, of, of this bound here. Okay, so 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 here we we bounded this. Um, yeah. So so what are we trying to do? Okay. All right, we're trying to bound the, the probability that that this, the least single value is small. Okay. okay. So now we have an inf rather than 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 a soup. But the inequality is going to get the other way now. Okay. So uh, once again, this is this is still a union. If you think about it, okay. still a, a union of a bunch of events. Um, but um, yeah. But again, this is an uncountable union, so you can't use the, the union map right away. Uh, you need an inequality like this in order to uh, uh, to proceed. Okay, so um, all right. So the analogous inequality. So now we need to understand the inf. Only in this sphere. 
Um, and so the, the analogous inequality is that the, the inf on the unit sphere, if sigma is a maximal epsilon net, for some epsilon bigger than zero, and say less than one, um, the inf on the sphere can be bounded by the inf on a net, right? Uh, but you pay a price, uh, and the price you pay is epsilon times the upper in all. Okay, and this is the same proof. Okay, so you know this, this inf is, is attained by some mx. You approximate mx by some uh, you x, x by some y, where y lies in this net, and now you use the triangle inequality in the other direction to estimate the error, and the error you just bound by the upper norm. So previously, um, the upper norm was the same quantity that was on the left hand side, and so you could you could absorb this term onto the left hand side. Now it's a different quantity, so you can't you can't get you can't just get rid of it, but we have a theorem now that bounds this. Okay, so, so this quantity is basically epsilon times a constant times root n with really high probability. Okay, so this is not so bad. Okay, um, so this, this error is kind of tolerable. And so um, because of that, um, this inf, you can basically bound by um, the inf over the net. Uh, maybe less than c over two, root n, uh, if you pick epsilon small enough. Okay, so previously we, had, we chose epsilon equals one half. Now epsilon has to be, has to be a bit smaller, uh, depending on, on little c and big c. Okay, because uh, you, you want this area here to be less than, say, half of, uh, let's say, uh, less, less than the c over two root n here. Okay, so, so you, you have to pick little c first and then pick, pick epsilon. But let, let me not uh, keep too much careful track of these parameters. Okay, um, uh, maybe just one tiny technical point here. So um, there is this exceptional event where this fails, um, and there is this uncountable union floating around here, which looks bad. But um, it, it, this, this is a single event. It, it doesn't depend on x. Uh, the, 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 the probability of this upper norm is, is too big. That's, that's just a single event. You can take it out once. You, know, you take it out uh, many times. So, um, so this is not a problem. Okay, and then this, again, you can, you can bound by... Um, the entropy cost, which is some, some constant of epsilon to the n, times the probability of a single. Thank you. Okay. So um, this is this is looking, uh, and this is a little c. Okay. So this is a very similar situation to where we were with the largest singular value. Um, the entropy cost is a bit is a bit bigger now. So previously it was eight to the n. Now it's a, some bigger thing to the n. Um, so hopefully, though, we can still, ooh, ooh, ooh. Ah, actually, um, uh, yeah, uh, so something very crucial happens here, actually. Um, the entropy cost is actually a C of epsilon to the P, uh, not M, um, because um, my net is taking values in the P-dimensional sphere. Uh, so actually, maybe, uh, I, I should, maybe I said N, but I should have said a P. Um, yeah, so I'm taking a net in the P-dimensional sphere, so, so there's this, this this loss here is, one of, is like one of epsilon to the p. Um, now this would turn out to be very important, actually, because the, um, um, okay, so just to sort of, uh, oh, I actually need uh, to be a bit more precise here. Um, yeah, so the, the precise epsilon I need, actually, some, I think I actually need to, to tell you what this epsilon is. Uh, yeah, so uh, this epsilon is actually, uh, I think, like little c over, over two big c. Um, okay, um, and then so this is something like, like uh, C epsilon. Okay. All right. So yeah. So what's going to happen is that the entropy cost is is now this relatively big quantity, one of epsilon to the p. But what's going to happen is that each individual term here is going to be something like like um, it's going to be the size of this is going to be something like like epsilon to the n. Roughly speaking. Uh, and in order to get an exponential gain, it becomes crucial that n is a little bit bigger than p uh, in order to, to, to be able to, uh, to cancel off the term. So I, uh, otherwise, you can't win. Okay, so um, that, that's what's going to happen. Actually, technically, I won't quite get, um, I will lose a little bit. Um, I won't actually get uh, um, epsilon to n. I'll get epsilon to something slightly less than n, but still bigger than p. Um, Okay, so it, yeah, so you can already see that the least single value uh, is much more delicate than the largest, largest single value. You have to pay much more attention to how various constants depend on each other. Okay, 
So um, this expression looks very much like what we had before. In fact, I can even reuse some of the stuff here. Um, okay, so we're now, so rather than bound the, the probability that this sum is very big, we now want to bound the probability that a sum like this is, is very small. Something like this. Okay, so um, we now have um, yeah, a sum of independent random variables, and we want to, to bound the probability that, that their sum is small. Now, um, when we were binding the upper tail, we could use this exponential movement method, which was very convenient. Um, turns out for the lower tail, uh, this is not as convenient. Um, I mean, you could try playing on over negative exponential, but this turns out to not be so, uh, so convenient. Um, so uh, we're not going to use the exponential moments here. Do something slightly different. Um, okay, so um, if this sum is small, then on average, uh, each term on average is, is less. Okay, so this is, this is saying that this is bound by c squared epsilon squared on average. Um, now, it would be really nice if I could replace this average with uniformly. Okay, so uh, if it was, you know, um, if bounding the average was the same as bounding just uniformly each pointwise um, sum and by c squared epsilon squared, then um, this expression would be just the same thing as uh, the product that, that an, an individual. Okay, so um, if this was a uniform bound here, then because these are all IID uh, random variables, the probability that, that each of these sum ends is, uh, is bounded by c squared epsilon squared is just the probability that a single term is bounded by c squared epsilon squared raised to the power n. Okay? Um, now, if I could do that, um, then I'd basically be done, uh, well, hopefully, because um, this random variable, so I mean, what is this xi dot x? Um, there's a normalization which I seem to have lost. Ah, f, here it is. Okay, so remember, xi is just um, a vector of plus or minus ones. Okay, and x is some vector um, on the unit sphere. Okay, so. Um, There is no n. Sorry? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, which now worries me. No. OK, yes, yes. Okay, good. Yes, that is. No, that still worries me. Oh, no, good, okay. It's, 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 yeah. There was no, yeah. right. there was no end. Right. Okay, so xi dot x, what it is, is it's, it's plus or minus x1 plus or minus, it's a random walk. Okay, or if you like, it's a sum of n independent random variables, each one of which, um, so this is a random variable of mean zero and variance x1 squared, mean zero, variance x1, um, x2 squared, and so forth. So the whole sum, this is a random variable of mean zero and variance one. Okay, and we're summing lots and lots of independent independent random variables. So um, the expectation here is that, is that we, we should have some sort of central limit theorem kicking in. Okay, we expect from the central limit theorem um, that we expect the distribution of each of these guys to behave roughly like a, a normal random variable of mean zero and variance one. Okay, that's what the central limit theorem teaches us. Okay, this is not rigorous. I'll come back to that later. Uh, not yet rigorous. Okay, but it, but if this was um, normally distributed, then this expression would indeed be just basically one over epsilon, be order one over epsilon, because uh, you're asking for the probability that a normal vector is less than basically constant times epsilon, and that occurs with probability epsilon, and so that would give me this one of this uh, this epsilon to the n. E, sorry, order epsilon. <laughs> okay. Um, so each individual probability would be a size epsilon raised to the power n. That would give you this, this, this epsilon to the n. And that would, count, that would just barely counteract this one of epsilon to the p uh, entropy cost if n is a little bit bigger than p. OK? So that's the strategy. Um, so there's, there's, there's two things to clean up here. Um, one is that we don't have a uniform bound. We only have this bound on, on average. 
Um, and the other is, is that uh, we need to, to make it more rigorous, the central limit theorem type heuristic here. OK, so um, uh, to replace on average with uniform is not too hard. Uh, th this is just Markov's inequality. OK, so, um, okay, so not for Markov's inequality, but if um, xi dot x squared is small, Then each individual term, okay, so we can't say that every term is less, is less than, than the mean, but we can say that every term is less than it's the mean times, say, uh, 2 over delta for at least uh, 1 minus delta over 2 um, values. I'm saying the values of, of i. Okay, so Marcus and Quartos is us that for that while not every term is bounded by the average, most of the terms are bounded by some large multiple of the average. Okay, and it turns out that, that uh, the right factor to use is 2 over delta here. Okay, so, so most terms are bounded by some larger constant multiple epsilon squared um, for most of the n. Okay, so we don't get all the n anymore, we get most of the n. Um, and, and, and that's why at the end of the day, instead of getting an epsilon to the n, we get an epsilon to slightly less than n, but that's still bigger than p, and so we're still going to squeeze out a win. Okay, now, um, unfortunately, um, the, uh, um, okay, so um, Markov's inequality tells you that, that, that most of the values are bounded, but it doesn't tell you precisely which values are bounded. Um, so of the numbers 1 to n, there's, there's, there's 1 minus delta over 2 n of them, which are bounded, but you don't know which ones. Um, so because you don't know which ones, you have to um, apply the union bound one more time. And so there's an additional, additional entropy cost. of n choose uh, 1 minus delta over 2n. Okay, so because this is the number of ways in, in, in which you can choose the indices which this is big. So when you actually run the argument properly, this is extra cost that, 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 that you have to take care of. But when delta is small, this, this turns out to actually be, be not too bad, that you can, you can absorb it in, in, the, um, in the losses that, that, uh, that you have here. Okay, so let me just mention that, but this is, just, this is a cost that you have, to, you have to deal with. Okay, but um, this is how you deal with the first problem. Okay, of, of, of not having uniform control here. Um, and then, um, in order to make the central limit theorem precise, uh, you need some version of the Berea scene theorem. Okay, so the Berea scene theorem is a theorem that um, uh, is basically designed to make quantitative this sort of central limit theorem type, type heuristics. So the precise version of the COT that is actually needed is the following. Okay, and this will actually be one of the first exercises in the problem set. Um, okay, so, yeah, so, so let y be a random of the cube. Uh, x is a unit vector. Uh, actually, I So then um, y dot x should behave like a Gaussian. Um, and in particular, it can't concentrate too much at any given point. So for any t and any epsilon, the probability that you are bounded, you'll lie within epsilon of any given point t, uh, you can bound by an absolute constant times, um, times epsilon uh, plus um, the third moment. Okay, so any of you who have actually seen the Berea-Scheme theorem would have seen that the third moment shows up pretty much always uh, whenever you do this, uh, um, you do the theorem. Um, okay, so, this, so the second moment is, is what's equal to one. So another way to think about this third moment is that you, you, can, you can bound this third moment by the soup. Okay. So, um, so um, basically, um, as long as the... Um, uh, as long as this vector is, is fairly spread out. So, so you have a unit vector, so, so the, the total mass of the vector is one. So as long as your vector is delocalized, that, that it, it doesn't concentrate its energy too much, its L2 mass too much at any, any given coordinate, but if it's spread out, um, if it's spread out over many, many different coordinates, then there's, there's enough, uh, then the central, central limit theorem starts kicking in that this random sum becomes, becomes more and more Gaussian and you get this Gaussian type behavior. Okay, so, um, okay, so if you use this, 
Um, so if it wasn't for this term, okay, if, you could, if, um, if it wasn't for this term, you get an epsilon here, and that would give you the, the epsilon that you need over here, and that would let you, let you close the argument. Um, so this theorem will turn out to, to, to work. So it works in so far as it gives you the right bound, um, as long as x is what's called incompressible. Um, which means that it's, it's, it's not supported on, on too sparse of a set. Um, actually, what is the precise, actually? Yeah, um, yeah, okay, so actually the precise notion incompressible I need is that um, if you look at uh, the small values, okay, that, that this is bigger than some fixed constant, say, eta. Okay, so the total sum is equal to one, um, so you have this vector whose total magnitude sum up to one, and what this is saying is that uh, if you look at, at, on, at only, only those components which are small, which less, less than epsilon, you want the components that are small to, to already have a, um, a large amount of mass um, um, to, to capture some significant fraction of, of this mass. And this, this is an absolute constant. Um, the, you can precisely see in the notes exactly what you take it to be. But um, as, as, as long as your vector is somehow spread out, um, over many, many different, um, different values, then this sort of barrier scene type anti-concentration result would give you the right sort of bound needed to, to close up this argument. So the one last thing that you need to deal with, okay, so one also has to deal with, with compressible vectors. Um, yeah, the notation comes from image processing. Um, so these are vectors that are almost sparse. Okay? Vectors x1 through xp, say, that are close to a sparse vector. Okay, you know, so the, uh, the opposite regime is when there's just a very small number of coordinates from 1 to p which capture most of the mass, and, and everything else captures a, a negligible amount of mass. So it, it, it's, it's almost, it's, it's almost um, sparse, it's got, a, it's got a, almost got a sparse representation. So you, know, you could compress it by throwing away all, the, um, um, all this noise, and you, you'd be able to, to get a much smaller um, data representation of your image, you know, of your vector, just like um, you know, when you take, a, you take image compression, you, 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 you capture the most important features, and, and often you can shrink the size of your image file. Anyway. So, so there's this exceptional compressible set of compressible vectors. You know, for example, one zero zero zero, a good example of a very um, compressible vector, the most compressible vector. So, you know, um, in that case, you know, the Barrier scene theorem just um, sort of fails miserably. You know, in, in that, um, you know, uh, this random sum is, is now just plus or minus one. Okay, there is no central limit behavior going on here, and so the probability that we, with an epsilon of one is one half. Right? It doesn't go to zero. So epsilon goes to zero. So you lose the central limit theorem, so you can't use barrier scene. So um, you do have to deal with, with these vectors separately. Um, um, but how do you do that? So the, um, the, the, the one remaining observation uh, is that these vectors have much less entropy. The set Okay, so remember we were covering the entire sphere by some epsilon net. Uh, if you want to deal with the compressible vectors, the compressible vectors form some subset of the sphere. Uh, and it turns out it's a much smaller subset of the sphere. And that if you, try, if you try to find um, a maximum epsilon net um, for, for these compressible vectors, uh, depending on how you choose the parameters, um, the, the, the size of the net you need is actually no longer exponentially big. It's only polynomially big, uh, as it turns out. Um, and so the entropy cost is much, much smaller for these um, vectors. And so because of that, you, you, um, you can get by with a much smaller, uh, much worse bound um, on, 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 on this expression here. So um, yes, for the compressible vectors, what, what happens is, is that the, um, the, the, the compressible net is only polynomial in size rather than exponential in size. And um, this, this probability here, rather than getting like an epsilon to the n, uh, you can get something like 0.999 to the n. You can get you can get a very tiny exponential gain 
here. Um, but you, you don't need to save this epsilon vector anymore. Um, because you notice, for example, even in, in the worst case, when the vector is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, um, this probability, while it's no, no longer epsilon, is still less than half. Okay, it was still less than half. Okay, that, 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 uh, that even when you have a single sign, the, uh, um, you can't concentrate all your random walk in a single point. Um, so you can squeeze some number less than one um, um, here. And here, you just get a polynomial bound. And that's still good enough when you combine, you combine these two. So yeah, I'm skipping a lot of details, but they are provided in the notes. And I think Nick will go through some of these things in a little bit more detail in the first TA session. Um, yeah, so, but this is the general strategy of the epsilon net argument. Right? You, 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 you have, um, a, you're trying to bound a super and, inf, uh, and initially it might be uncountable or ranging over a very big um, set. So you first refine your parameter space to, to you discretize it to something, to something smaller. Um, and then you can bound each term separately, you pay your entropy cost, and then you just try to control as best you can um, the contribution of each, each individual point in your parameter space. And what normally happens in, uh, in these cases is that for most of, of the points, you get a very good bound, but then there are these exceptional points for which you, you, get, you can only get a lousy bound, but what often saves you is that in, 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 the, in that exceptional case, the entropy is a lot smaller. And so you have to go back and compute the entropy again. Um, so yeah, the arguments get, get quite, uh, uh, quite sophisticated um, as you, you do harder and harder estimates, but, the, but the, this is the general strategy uh, of the epsilon net method. And, this, and we'll uh, be able to, to adapt this method to do um, uh, square matrices in the next lecture. Okay. I, off the top of my head, I, I, maybe if your matrix is very, very rectangular, um, it might be possible. Uh, but I doubt it. You know, if your matrix is almost square, you know, 0.99n by n, I don't think so. But I, uh, uh, okay, it's possible that if you're very clever and use really efficient estimates everywhere. Um, okay, but but certainly the, the closer you get to square matrices, the, the more delicate this, this becomes, and 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 you have to be very, very efficient everywhere. Okay, but. But if it's very, very eccentric, maybe it's possible.